And so what you realize when you have a 56,000 person team is there's no such thing as um, perfection and there's no such thing as everything going the way you hope it will. Hello, my name is Robert Schmidt. Uh, I am Deloitte's Chief Futurist, also known as Mr. IoT. Today on my Coffee with Mr. IoT, I actually was told I might have to rename it Smoothie with Mr. IoT. But sure. today as a guest, I have Dan Helfrich. Um, he's the CEO and Chairman of Deloitte Consulting. But actually, you like to be called the Captain of Deloitte Consulting. Welcome to the show, Dan. How are you doing? Robert, it's interesting times, but I'm happy to be with you. And that's the best shirt I've seen today so far. Thank you. I have to tell you, my wife made fun of me because I put real pants on for you. But other than that, yes. Mm. Thank you. So Dan, how are you doing? How's your family doing? We are in weird times, as you said, and there's a lot of people who are sick or troubled or so forth. How are you doing? Uh, personally, I feel um, fortunate above all else. Um, and then Physically and health-wise, I feel energized, uh, and um, you know there are days where the time doesn't go by very quickly, and the week doesn't go by very quickly, as I know lots are experiencing. But I will tell you, I um, I haven't spent this much time with my wife and my four kids on a continuous basis in a long, long time, and I'm trying to cherish every single second of that. Yeah, it's interesting. My wife said to me, this might be the longest time we've been together in one piece with all the travel I do. I, I find myself in this sort of, I appreciate exactly what you're saying. I'm like in a great place. I love my place where I'm at. And then there's always this undertone, this sort of like little darkness under it. Someone actually said to me that works with you, the, you're the eternal optimist. How do you do it? What do you do? Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd call myself an eternal optimist because when I hear people called that, um, at times, that means that they fail to understand reality. And I um, absolutely understand the reality of the conditions around me um, at all times. And the conditions around us right now as a society, as a business community, um, are serious. And we can't make light of that or find um, optimism that's misplaced. Now, the part of eternal optimist that I will, you know, accept as, as, as feedback or as a moniker is I absolutely believe that there are opportunities, even in situations that are dire, to um, create growth for people, to create growth for companies, to make an impact on society. And I'm always trying to find those in every situation, but not at the expense of confronting the realities of what the world has put in front of us. I, I gotta say, um, it's interesting, right? We come into these situations, you became CEO or the captain of us, like not quite a year ago. And, you know, I'm sure you didn't expect to be sitting here now in this situation. And so I've noticed when I am in situations like this, where there's something really extraordinary, something you didn't plan for, I find out things about myself I didn't know. What's something you found out about yourself in this situation that you didn't know, that you didn't expect that was a surprise, something like that? Hmm. I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, to be honest, thought about it that way. I, my life and my career has been um, filled with unexpected moments and twists and turns and um, I found myself able to adjust to those circumstances pretty quickly. And look, you you try to listen, you try to observe the environment around you, you try to gather lots of facts from a wide variety of people, you try to take counsel from a wide variety of people, and then you try to prioritize what set of decisions need to go first. And that same set of uh, philosophies, approaches, management techniques, whatever you want to call them, are pretty instinctive to me. And they're just being applied in a global pandemic, which uh, I never would have expected I would have had to face. But the the instincts I'm drawing upon are, are actually pretty familiar. 
that's interesting to hear how you know instinct versus you say this in some of your talks i find this super fascinating for all the leaders i've met and had in my life um working for various companies you and i have met through email and now on this call and i know so much personal things about you <laughs> more than i've known about any leader and i've actually heard this back from other people so i want to just say thanks for that because people actually recognize how you give us some of the truth or give us the truth that you know and then you also give us some of the personal stuff for example, I hope your son and his gashes are fine. It's just, you shared this on one of our calls. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Just one comment on that. I was talking to someone and um, someone from outside the firm who, you know, knows knows enough about us and knows enough about me. And, and you know, and he said, um, it's rare that someone, it, it's rare that someone attempts to scale relatability. And I, it was an interesting thing for me to think about. I've never intentionally tried to scale my relatability, but I have consistently tried, no matter the responsibility I have at the moment, to be authentically me, which means sharing of myself and my family and the little things that happen in, in day-to-day life. And um, that probably is a little different than the way most people um, go about it. Well, it's, it's fascinating, right? Because you said before that you rely a lot on your instincts around this and they come natural to you. So this whole concept of scaling uh, sounds very rational, sounds very brainy, and maybe that's not even how you think about it. It's, it, it's not at all. And the nice thing is, um, if you only have to have one personality and you only have to have one talk track, life's a lot simpler. And... And what I see people doing, and this is, you know, in society writ large with my clients, others, and, you know, at times in the firm, you're, you're trying to balance multiple personas and multiple narratives and talk tracks depending on the audience. And for me, that sounds really hard. And so the more I can have a single way of thinking about um, where I am in the moment, a single way of being it's uh it's it's a lot less of a burden and was this always the way you felt about it or is this something you learned over time oh uh, it took me to get into my late 40s to really actually own <laughs> that shirt which is it, it's an expression of me being different right and so i'm curious what was it for you uh yeah i think it's i think it has evolved i mean i was someone i went to grad school as a 20 year old, when I was um, still playing undergraduate soccer at Georgetown and I sort of graduated early and got myself into grad school and I was, you know, a 20 year old wearing shin guards to an MBA program. And, you know, I had to be comfortable being myself in an environment where there weren't others that looked like me at all. And I didn't conform to a lot of the norms of um, behavior, the norms of demographic of that environment. And so, you know, experiences like that have probably made that simpler. I mean, this is really diversity, right? This is owning your diversity and being part of the diversity. And I got to tell you, one of the reasons I'm at Deloitte and I'm back at Deloitte, I'm actually a boomerang. I left, uh, was an executive at a gaming company and now I'm back. Um, but the reason I came the first time and the second time was because I always feel out of place and I felt being out of place at Deloitte is okay. Uh, I, I, talk a little bit about this. I know you've talked about diversity to other folks, but it's sort of interesting to hear it related from you. Yeah, it's, if there's anything I want us to be, it is the most inclusive and di most diverse workplace um, that exists in our, in our industry. And I do believe deeply that um, white men, white men who've um, grown up with um, fortune and circumstances that their demographics have afforded them, like me, um, if you put you know, diversity at the top of the agenda and you really believe it, that you can be, I can be major catalysts of major change for good. And I think about that um, all the time. Look, diversity is um, very personal to me. I come from a large family. I'm the oldest of seven. 
we have uh, a multiracial family by way of adoption. It's a it's a fascinating um, environment, and I've learned from a very early age the value of um, different perspectives and the fact that there are others based on their demographics that have not had the fortune that I have. And paying it forward is about creating opportunity and investing in people to sort of equalize the playing field. And I think that's incredibly important. I, I was at some weekend workshop and I, there was a diversity conversation and they set up this line in the middle of the room and then they asked questions. And if you answered with yes, you step forward and with no, you step back. And there were questions like, did you grow up with your parents together? Do you have health insurance? You know, very basic questions. I really didn't relate to it. And then at the end of this thing, I stood almost at the front of the room and I looked back and I was like, okay, I visually, physically got it, what it meant to be privileged. And it was sort of a really interesting experience, not just to get it here, but kind of. Yeah. Thanks for that. I, I want to ask you about something. Maybe I'll shift a little bit. You talk about convene and detonate. And that was one of the two things I really thought was interesting. And you talked about this in October of last year. And I wanted to sort of like uh, hear from you. Do you feel similarly? Do you feel different? In particular, I'm curious, maybe almost like what are you sort of, I don't know what the right word is, not happy, but what are you sort of like actually seeing that detonates today because of what's going on that's going to benefit us? Yeah, I do. Look, we have a 56,000-ish person team. And so what you realize when you have a 56,000-person team is there's no such thing as um, perfection and there's no such thing as everything going the way you hope it will. So when you're thinking about major change, like in my case, you're talking about the word detonate, I've made a big emphasis on let's take traditional orthodoxies, habits, the status quo, and let's really challenge why they exist and whether or not they have a place in our future. Um, and I absolutely do see, Robert, examples all over the country and all over the world. When I go see a project team and they say, um, we, we saw one of your videos talking about detonating, orth detonating orthodoxies, and we realized we've been doing this same monthly status report and the same monthly status meeting the same way with our clients. And we realized that it was adding incredibly little value, and it was a routine that consumed time and effort and created no value. And because you helped us challenge that orthodoxy, we got rid of it. That to me, if I can replicate those micro changes, then over time, you get a groundswell of change in the culture and the approach. Now, there's clearly other things at a macro level that we're challenging in terms of fundamental business processes about how you run a large firm. But my view is that you get a groundswell from the bottom up you do some stuff top down to reinforce it and that creates the kind of change. And so I am happy because I'm seeing that stuff happen all over the place. And yet, as I said at the beginning, you know you're never done because you can always find examples where it isn't happening yet. So give us an example that we might not have heard. Something that might surprise us, almost like sort of like, what can I tease out of you now that's sort of like a little interesting tidbit for us, a detonation you, you might call? Well, we're detonating the concept of a tier one university for campus recruiting. You know, we, we like to talk about tier one equals a certain set of schools, and those certain set of schools, frankly, have a set of attributes for the most part that... Um, in my mind, can exclude um, people who don't have, uh, who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, who can't afford those prestigious um, institutions. And we're challenging what's the roster of places where we can acquire um, talent. We're detonating the way we think about um, the future of technology architects and solution architects in this firm. You know, I would argue that the Renaissance management consultant 
who has an MBA, who might have looked like the most important part of our future 10 years ago, who might have looked like me, is still important, but perhaps not as important as the greatest technical and solution architect who's knitting together these enterprise um, programs and systems we're doing for our clients. And so we have to detonate the way we think about talent models and the way we think about performance management and the way we think about compensation and rewards, the way we think about titling um, for that generation and, and type of uh, person. So those are some of the fun ones that we're in the midst of, uh, in the midst of dealing with. I, I thought I was personally affected by when you talked about the university part. I have two sons. Uh, one goes to a university, the other one decided not to. And I really had to sort of catch myself in supporting both of them the same way with all my enthusiasm because I love them both. I'm really proud of both of them. Yet one decided to do something totally different from what kind of feels normal and comfortable to me. So yeah. It's really interesting you talked about that. It's a, it's a great example. So I want to ask you about that technical thing, right? Me, my passion really is using good tech and putting it to good use. Uh, and then I try creative things. I don't know. I'm going to do a self-promotion. Have you ever seen Dub Dub? Have you, did you know I, that we created a Deloitte comic book? I have. I, I Dub Dub and I love the stuff we've done with Ella the Engineer, the comic books we've done there focused on um, women in STEM in particular. So yeah, comic book, comic books are the rage. Well, it's something you can send someone. I always give someone two books. I say one for you and for one, someone do you want to give it to? But I guess my question around this is you talk about sort of the Renaissance man and the solution man. Um, if I think of myself more as the solution man, um, I always find it takes me three sentences more than it takes you to get to the point. How do I sort of like um, put myself forward best as the solution, the technology man, and where we all together in the mission and so forth? What do you recommend? Well, um, two things. One, I, I would never call you the renaissance man or the solution man. I'd call you the person or the consultant or something because I wouldn't use that, um, that, that pronoun. Um, two things. One, I do think that one of the one of the skills in um, that we have the greatest scarcity of in the world is effective, concise, memorable communicators, um, either in writing or verbally. And there are things you can do. I tell people all the time, take improv classes because they help you listen and be articulate in uh, in moments and to live in the moment, that can be really effective in terms of um, communicating. So that's the first thing is, investing in your own communication capacity is absolutely worth it. That being said, we have to change the paradigm for what a well-rounded consultant looks like. And maybe there are going to be people who absolutely deserve the greatest recognition, the greatest compensation, the greatest career paths, who executive communication is going to be something they're not great at. And in a bygone era, we might have had that as a disqualifier to major career growth. My view is it shouldn't be a disqualifier anymore because we have to change our mindset of what the characteristics are of a leader in the future and not apply the same orthodoxy, not apply the same view that frankly for many of us is the view of looking in the mirror. We can't apply that same view to the future. Maybe people should do more coffee chats. That's my way of being present with you right now. So I wanna close with one question and I, I asked a few people when I told them that we were gonna talk uh, thanks, by the way, for doing this and responding so quickly. It blew my mind when you responded. I, I have a lot of appreciation for everything you get all the time. And so what I want to ask you is, and someone uh, suggested this question, I loved it, is um, six months out, how do you see the world? The world will be more virtual. The world will be more understanding of the power and frankly, criticality of digital to our collective future. The world will be more anxious. 
um, which is something we're all going to have to deal with. And with more an anxiety, maybe the world may be more risk averse in both uh, personal ways and, um, and business ways. I, I, I think the world will be um, optimistic about the future, or at least on the way to being optimistic about the future. And maybe that's Dan's eternal optimism, uh, you know, shining through. And what that means for uh, society and for business is all those things put together, there are going to be more old business models that get shattered and more new business models that emerge at a much more rapid pace. And, you know, healthcare is an obvious place where that is going to happen. Um, I would argue education is an obvious place where that will happen. But I think you will see um, major business transformation um, before we go. The last thing, Robert, I know you want to close that I wanted to share. Um, hey, is I'm here as long as you are here. I'm give, not going anywhere. <laughs> give, given given the show's name of Mr. IoT, I want to share with you a, a, a sort of leadership thing I think about that is very IoT-like, is I like to think that the best leaders um, are thinking about uh, leadership of things or internet of leadership. And what do I mean by that? It's that IoT, part of the brilliance is you have sensors arrayed throughout the world and you can interrogate those sensors at a particular time and see what they're telling you. And those sensors are gonna always feed back information to you. And the beautiful thing about those sensors is they're not applying judgment and they're not nervous about giving you the data. They're just giving you the data. And I think the best leaders have the widest array of sensors in their organization and the world. And as I think about myself, I'm always challenging, do I have enough sensors that aren't based on a management hierarchy, but that are based on being able to interrogate a wide variety of the people in my world to get real unfiltered information back and when those sensors are seeing things that, that are anomalous, are they going to feed it directly to me? And people are surprised by how much time I spend with staff and how much time I spend with people who don't look like they're in the organizational hierarchy. It's all because I want the vibrance of a great IoT-like sensor network to be helping me be an effective leader. I always say I find it funny how we call it the Internet of Things. We never call it the Internet of People. Um, yeah. I think we're going to go back to the Internet, and I, I love what you're talking about, having more senses in people around you, the more the better, uh, and uh, take things from there. I, I want to say thanks, and uh, you being Georgetown's sports announcer, um, I, can I ask you to close the show instead of me so someone actually finally gets the true professional experience of an announcer to close our show? It's been a wonderful conversation here from Robert Schmidt's couch in Dan Helfrich's office. It's been Coffee Chat with Mr. IoT. Back next week for a much more interesting guest. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>